I will use a selection of evidence to construct a fundamental framework for the early solar system and a protoplanetary disk. A selection means that, of course, there is more evidence and also that there is conflicting evidence. I cannot show all of this. This is just to give an idea of what, how such a framework could look like. I will do this by using this plot. Here on the x-axis on this plot is a time scale, a qualitative time scale between about 0 and 4 millions of years. We know the timing of the events in the early solar system from, for example, the decay of short-lived radionuclides such as the 26 aluminum system, but also from long-lived systems like, for example, uranium lead. On the y-axis is a temperature scale. Again, this is more qualitative between 0 and 2000 Kelvin. And we know temperatures from, for example, condensation considerations, liquidous temperatures of, for example, chondrules, and so on. Now, at the very beginning, parts of the solar nebula were evaporated. All the material was in the gas phase. Whether this was only close to the sun or scattered throughout the disk, it is not yet clear. And in these reservoirs, sea ice condensed. We know this because sea ice have a zoned structure, have irregular outlines that all points to a condensation origin. Also, there are element patterns often point to a condensation origin. The sea ice are among the first solids we have, which means they anchor the timing of the early solar system at T0. This is why these are at T0 and at very high temperatures because they condense from a gas. The sea ice are likely xenoliths in most of the chondrites and were therefore likely stored in a separate reservoir and later incorporated into the chondrite parent bodies. The condensation might have also destroyed the initial parts of the initial material, so the interstellar material, and then this, uh, from the gas, this then recondensed as the high temperature material such as, for example, olivin. So this is what happened here in this second step, condensation aggregation, aggregation of the coronal precursor aggregates. It might also have been that at this time, in the regions where the individual chondrites formed, the temperature was rather high or had different um, ambient temperatures, which caused some um, volatile, was the source of the volatile depletion patterns we observe in bulk chondrites, because at a very high temperature, or at a higher ambient temperature, the materials, the material did not fully condense, and what remained in the gas phase, of course, was not then incorporated into metride, and this is, um, might, might have been the source for the volatile depletion pattern, so we have a temperature that is somewhere with a couple of hundred Kelvin. And at this time, there might have also been the addition here of pre-solar grains or carbon-rich material. After this was the enigmatic chondral formation event, which we know must have exceeded maybe 2000 Kelvin or something around 2000 Kelvin from the liquidus temperatures of the mafic chondrules. And this lasted only minutes to hours, which you also know from observation that the mesostasis is glassy, that there's high contents of, for example, the volatile sodium, and also from experiments that re reproduce these textures and have um, a very short heating event. And chondrules also likely acted as open systems because chondrules in the center have this red, false color, red olivine, and is surrounded by this blue shell of low calcium pyroxene. And this is most likely formed by the exchange of um, SEO-rich gas from fractional condensation. So the olivine form, the gas increasing becomes increasingly more SiO rich and this SiO then reacts with the olivine to form this shell here of low calcium pyroxene. And this is observed in many chondrules. This is the dominant chondral type with this porphyritic chondrule with this zonation. So therefore it's like um, we have evidence for this open system and there's much more evidence for open system um, from also isotopes and so on. So this was a very short process. Um, chondral formation exchange with the surrounding gas. Also we know, for example, from isotope studies that the isotope variations, which is shown up here in the chondrules, are rather small. 
And you would expect that the isotope fractionations are higher, but for example in iron, but also in many other isotopes, the variation is just a few per mil, maybe one, two per mil. We would expect maybe 10 per mil or 20 per mil or something like this. And this is most likely because the ambient pressure was very high and this suppressed um, effective large uh, fractionations of the isotopes. This would also explain the high sodium content, content in the chondrules. And the pressure might have, might have exceeded something like 10 or well, was much larger than 10 pascals here. So there's a high surrounding pressure around the chondrules. And then there's the chondro matrix complementarity, which is shown as an example in this plot here. So there's silicon on X and magnesium on the Y axis, and chondrules are up here. Matrix is down here, and this is the CI ratio line, and the bulk is exactly on the CI ratio line. And the, the bulk of this chondrite uh, plots exactly on the intersection between the mixing line of these matrix chondro reservoir and the CI ratio line. And this point, so the, the most simple explanation here is that there was a about CI reservoir, at least for magnesium silicon, and this then separated into the chondrules and the matrix, the chondrules by the evapor uh, by the condensation process, or something like this. So this means, from this complementarity, this is uh, shown here, something like this, that after chondral formation, in the same reservoir, the matrix, or some kind of proto-matrix that was later altered, on the pan body, for example, formed in the same Reservoir. So there was a single reservoir for chondrule and matrix formation and a high temperature event here, and this reservoir had um, high pressure. And then to this complementary or to the matrix, there was maybe some CI material added because when we look at the volatile depletion pattern, in fact, the highest volatile elements have a flat pattern. And this is most easily explained by the addition of some CI material because CI material is also flat. These are normalized plots in the volatile depletion patterns and this would then put us up. And this seems to be some evidence that CI material or CI-like material was later added to the chondrite as well. And this, when we look at the, the chondral composition, we see that there's a certain variation in the bulk chondral compositions. So chondrules do not have all the same composition, therefore variation in the composition. And this might also be explained by this open system process here, whereby some of the chondrules exchange more material with the surrounding than others, maybe due to their surface to volume ratio to um, variations in the time they were, uh, they experienced heating, or maybe the peak temperature, something like this. And then this entire chondral formation process was repetitive, maybe two to five times. We know this because we find relic grains in chondrules or other chondrules in chondrules, so it must have been repetitive. It cannot have been too repetitive because if in each case chondrules disaggregate and are assembled together, then there should be a homogenization in the bulk chondral compositions, which we do not observe. And therefore, this might have been something like two to five times the repetition in chondrule formation. And then there is a number of various chondrites, the CV chondrites, the MCR chondrites, and so on. And they all have very distinct characteristics. Chondrule size, composition of the chondrules, um, abundance of chondrules, chondrules and matrix, and so on. And these very distinct differences among the chondrite groups um, are best explained by various regions in which the various chondrites form, the CV chondrites in one side, one area of the protoplanetary disk, the R's in the other, and so on. This is what we know from these differences here. And then it might have been that when you look at pre-solar grains, for example, we find that um, a number of chondrites, or the carbonaceous chondrites, are um, isotopically different with respect to nucleosynthetic anomalies, are isotopically different than non-carbonaceous chondrites, such as ordinary enzyme chondrites. So the ordinary enzyme chondrites likely formed at the inner part of the protoplanetary disk, which is the sun as the protoplanetary disk, in the inner part, and in the outer part, there were the carbonaceous chondrites, and they received from the outside some pre-solar grains, which the, the non-carbonaceous chondrites did not receive. And one reason why this happened might have been Jupiter here in between, which um, prohibited gravitationally that this material also was transported more to the inside of the disk. And finally, everything was agglomerated 
into the parent body now together with the sea ice which formed after maybe something like four millions of years. So this is the a possibility for a framework of the early solar system um, and again this is based on a selection of evidence more could be added some could be brought up that is conflicting with details here but in general this seems to be a good starting point to to understand the events in the early solar system